It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome back to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders on this Tomlin Tuesday. How are we doing, Alan? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Been uh been a busy day for me. We're doing some stuff on the back end of the site, working on some technology mm. stuff, working on uh, helping out my my college uh, teammates there. Uh, Mike Asty covering a coaching search in West Virginia, which yeah. if you care about your your uh, your journalist friends, don't ever wish a coaching search on them. It's the worst thing in the world. Uh, so they have that coming up. Why, and then, why do you uh, say that? What's oh, uh, it's just the it's it's awful. Like it, it's like being in a fist fight for news uh it's just mm. it's it's bad nobody wants to talk on the record and everybody lies about everything when they do talk on the record and it's a mess uh, can i on the record say that i believe it's going to be barry odom that is hired at west virginia okay i will on the record <laughs> say that i do not think it will be barry odom okay all right but i will also on the record say that if it is barry odom and he yeah. brings brennan marion with him that West Virginia would score about 70 points in the backyard brawl this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hey, I mean, you know why I'm saying it because of the connection with Odom there now, but that'd be hilarious too if Brendan Marion was then there. Blaine yeah. Stort's there. Like, yeah, West Virginia, that coaching staff. Uh all right, but anyways, this is not a West Virginia podcast, it's a Steelers podcast. It was Tom on Tuesday, Alan. Let's dive into some of that. Uh Alex Highsmith looks like he should be able to go this week. We thought potentially it would be last week. He certainly was chomping at the bit to get out there, being cautious with it, 100 percent get it. But now, you know, this early in the week for Tomlin to say that he feels good about his return. I think that that certainly would bode well for him returning against the Cleveland Browns. He's back. Yeah. Next question. I think that one's that one's in the in the can that that's happening. Mm -hmm. I thought he probably could have played this past week in a limited role, uh, but I understand mm -hmm. why they didn't want him to. And so uh, he's back. He'll start. He'll be full go. But I think we're still going to see Nick Herbig. And I don't know how you take him completely out of the rotation anyway, because forced fumbles in three straight games mm -hmm. uh, had the third fastest sack of the NFL season. Next gen stats told me today uh, in that strip sack of Joe Burrow. Uh, he is second to TJ Watt in forced fumbles in the NFL this season. And he's only started five games. Nick Herbig's having a heck of a year. Mm -hmm. But they haven't had all three at their disposal since what week three, the home opener against the chargers. Like they've yes. had one of them missing, uh, or both at, at times, uh, missing in, in the case of Herbig and Highsmith for a period of time. But so they haven't had all three. We talked a lot about like these three outside linebacker packages that we want to see. I feel like we're going back to like the three safety looks that were just never able to come to fruition because of injuries. Now it's been the three linebackers outside linebacker thing. They've been playing three been safety all year. Up. That one's happening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one's happening, but I'm saying for a while, for like two years, it yeah, seemed yeah, like it yeah. couldn't happen because of injuries. Now it's happening. The three outside linebacker stuff we've been wanting to see but haven't been able to due to injury. I guess the question becomes how do you deploy it? Obviously, you want to see get all three of those guys on the field at times together, especially as you just mentioned with how productive Herbig has been when he's on the field, how good Alex is in terms both as a pass rusher and setting the edge as a run defender. You know, we've talked about the idea of moving TJ around, but he's, he's just productive in that one spot. Like he, if he's that good there why would you want to move him around so what's the best way to deploy a three outside linebacker set so they usually have a, a one of them stand up in the middle of the defense somewhere some people call it a joker some people call it a mm -hmm. spinner whatever you want it to be and that person usually is not going to rush where he lines up and so what you'll have is you'll have like your your traditional four rushers that person will be standing in one gap and then the reason they call it a spinner or a joker is that he's going to like, you know, spin to another gap or run or twist with a defensive lineman or something like that to not only create uncertainty about who's rushing, but also where everyone is rushing from. Um, it's really good if you want to run a five man rush, by the way, the Steelers rushed five guys or more 10 times against Joe Burrow. They got eight sack or eight pressures on those 10 blitzes. So I, I understand people want him to do it more, but I think it's probably just as important to get home at a high level when you do it. And I think that's a really good use. Also, Nick Herbig is good in coverage. So you can line him up there, mugged up over the center, like, here I come, here I come. No, actually, I'm just the curl flat zone. Never mind. 
fooled you. Mm-hmm. Like if you think about like what Russell Wilson was doing in that game against the Bengals, where it was just all these like immediate checkdowns, where like he would be throwing the ball in a half a second, and the Steelers were getting like eight yards. You can't do that unless you know exactly where the blitzers are coming from. What using a third outside linebacker does is make it really hard for the quarterback to know who's rushing and who's not. Have we seen them use Herbig in that way in the middle of the field? Because certainly like some spot drop stuff where he's covering the flat and things like that, certainly. But I can't recall too many times, if at all, where I've seen him utilized in the middle of the field that way. I've seen it. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. (laughs) All right. There we go. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I don't know I if you. the world has. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think I've seen a little bit of it. Okay. Well, I, I'm excited for it to come to fruition. Uh, hopefully, on Sunday we can see a little bit more of it. I just think back, like when we talked about these three outside linebacker sets. I think back to 2020, the first year that we had Alex Highsmith in the fold after drafting him. They still obviously had Bud Dupree at the roster on the roster at the time, and like that game against the Ravens where they all play, like even Highsmith played like 50 percent of the snaps. Actually, got his first pick in that game. Got his first pick before he got his first sack uh, in the NFL. And I just think of the way that those three were deployed together at that period of time, and I think that's how. You know, I envision them using those three guys. Yeah, third downs a lot, like almost exclusively, right? Like, it, it, especially mm-hmm. against the team without a running quarterback. With a running quarterback, it's a little easier to do it more often. Um, but I think third downs a lot. You know, I would, I would want that. This isn't necessarily related, but I was watching that game last night between the Browns and Broncos, and I'm very upset that we already utilized all of our Minka Fitzpatrick is finally going to end his interception drought predictions because I think Jameis is going to be dying to end that drought for Minka next week <laughs> so i'll let the fans do it somebody so, in the comments so, i have so to have tried call it's done yeah. yeah um but anyways tomlin talked about high smith's return using three outside linebackers and stuff like that what else came of uh tom on tuesday do you think you like some bullet points to bring up on here well i think the big story to me was joey porter jr is a serial killer and t higgins is Shaq. Yeah, so I, obviously I want to talk about those two kind of independently because I think the T. Higgins thing is also really interesting. But, uh, yeah, Joey Porter Jr. having a serial killer mentality. I mean, what is what does he mean by that? Like, what is the, the correlation to what he was saying there? If Did he dive into it at all? Or just it was a blanket nah, statement? And- <laughs> I mean, what he's trying to say is that, like, a, a regular murderer like just kills once i guess and a serial killer like what has happened before has not has not changed his mentality going forward right okay all right like, uh, and so joey porter jr once yeah i mean i would have probably said like you know an nba player that's missed like 10 consecutive threes but is willing to keep shooting you know like that never hey, say you can't, never you, can't you can't talk about shooting in the nfl uh, you just uh, yeah, anything, okay, yeah, gun, anything gun or 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 projectile related serial killer though. I mean, maybe he's like a you know the Boston Strangler. You know, like I as far as I know, that's legal, right? Uh, just just no <laughs> n- no finger. Oh. No finger. I point. just realized George Pickens' next first down celebration is going to be like strangling. There you as go. Opposed, or like yeah, as long as he's not doing the the finger gun or anything like that, then. I guess so. Um, all right, but as it relates to to T. Higgins, I guess you said com- you know, compared him to Shaq because you're willing to take those penalties, which you actually talked about. Like, hey, if you're going to take a five yard, you know, defensive holding or illegal contact penalty or whatever like that <clears throat> to stop him from having a big chunk play, I guess you take that trade off. But we can talk about that in, in also. But like, honestly, to me, what stands out about this more than anything else is just how complimentary Mike Tomlin has been of T. Higgins for a while now. Like, it just seems like he talked about him in the same light as you know a Mister Jackson, a Mister Chubb. I think T. Higgins might be his Bengals guy out out of the division. Like, that's how he I talks. Think so. about I think so. I like forget Joey Porter for a second. Mike Tomlin wants T Higgins on his team. Like it, it, it could not be any more obvious that Mike Tomlin wants T Higgins on his team and T Higgins is going to be a free agent. So Mike Tomlin might get T Higgins on his team, but like, it's the same way he talked about Patrick queen when he was a Raven. Like it's very similar. Um, I right now, if you, if I was making betting odds, 
like like someone does for everything. You know, what who's the next team for actually I just saw these yesterday. There was a, a post came out. Next team odds for Aaron Rodgers. Steelers were fifth. Oh, yeah. Uh fifth, fifth best odds for Aaron Rodgers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can never fade those odds, sadly. They don't let you do that. Because I would make a fortune. Uh but uh <laughs> if I was setting the next team odds for T. Higgins, is anyone besides Pittsburgh going to the top of that list right now? Like it's very clear that the Steelers want T. Higgins. I, I, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. I'm curious to see how that that fit would work. But you know what's interesting to me about it, more so than anything else, because obviously the player is awesome when he's been on the field. But that's just it. When he's been on the field, how many times do we have we talked about Mike Tomlin availability being the best ability, being hand in hand? That's how many times has he preached that T. Higgins hasn't played a ton of football over the last couple of seasons. He hasn't been available. So like. Is it odd to you that he's so infatuated with this player? Yes. But no, when you watch, I mean, look, T. Higgins is 6'4", 220. He's a bully of a wide receiver. He is clearly the kind of player that Mike Tomlin like, likes. It's just, you know, he can't stay healthy. Um, he's also been really, really good against the Steelers. Yeah, the, it's also very important. To take so of there that. is like, I, I do think there is like a, a kind of correlation there where the Steelers often seem to like picking up players that just look really good when they play Pittsburgh. It's one of those like double check mark things, I think, right? Like the Atlanta yeah. Falcons say they do that with Georgia players where it's like went to Georgia, gets a double check. What's well, like this player is good, also has killed us. So double check <laughs> yeah. mark yeah. on this guy. Yeah. And ripping him away from a division rival might be a triple check. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Certainly, and Patrick Queen would fall into that one. Um, so could he, could he be this upcoming off season's version of Patrick Queen for the Pittsburgh? Like Steelers? if I could get some odds on that, I would put twenty dollars on it right now. That uh, T Higgins man for Steelers next year. So another player that we want to talk about within here is George Pickens. You know he's going to be looking for a new contract. If you go out, you break the bank on a T Higgins. I don't know what his free agent contract would look like or anything like that, or the way it would be structured. Does that change how that could look? Well, I mean, you need two of them, right? Like, and so sure. we've seen some teams. I, I pay like Jalen Waddles making big money as a wide receiver too. Devonta Smith's making big money as a wide receiver too. I don't think mm -hmm. it's unreasonable for a team to pay that. I'm just not sure the Steelers would be the team that wants to. Also, like, what are they doing a quarterback? What are they doing a running back? Like, I like, they can't yeah. sign them all, right? If they can't. Say okay, Russ. Here's a hundred million dollars, and also we're keeping Najee, and also we're paying George, and also we got to pay T.J. Watt, and also yeah, let's get T. Higgins. Like that, that's not going to work. There is not an unlimited uh, fountain of funds. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's plausible to keep both wide receivers. I'm yeah. not sure that the Steelers would. It could also be a situation where you can do it for a short time. But you kind of get yourselves into like like the 49ers with Ayuk and Debo. Like they can keep them for this year. Okay, it's just not gonna be able to last. Yeah. Well, and, and the reason that I asked that is because I, I think that you're right. You've seen across the league different teams be able to do so, but specifically because we're talking about the Steelers paying two wide receivers while not knowing what's going on at quarterback. And you brought up the running back too, and I wasn't even considering that. But like really thinking about the way that the Steelers operate this offense specifically assuming Arthur Smith still going to be the guy here uh, and also the uncertainty in terms of the quarterback going forward or if it is Russ what that contract looks like going forward that's where I'm like man are they going to pay two guys and not to say that that would mean T wouldn't be in the plans I'm more so wondering like okay if he is if that is a guy that they're going to target in free agency does that change their the outlook for George yeah and that was so, the uh, subject to the morning rush this morning talking about George and his antics and whether they're affecting the team's willingness to give him a second contract. I don't know what's going to happen there. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely interested to see how things play out. I, I get the sense from a lot of people in the team that they're very unhappy with George um, in, in terms of the things he says and does out sort of outside the whistle, uh, in, you know, inside the, the field of play, it's been pretty, pretty positive this year. I mean, he had the incident with the blocking and he's still not a good blocker, but seems like he's mostly going out there and doing what he's told. Um, 
But yeah, I I, I don't know. But I, I think the interest in T. Higgins is real, that's for sure. I had somebody uh, around the team, not on the team, around the team, tell me that they feel like he's really stretching that be who you can afford to be that we always hear. Like he's really challenging that internally. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are, let me say this. Like I don't talk to like Omar about mm -hmm. this stuff during the season, but there are some people that I do talk to. And like, if those people are making these decisions, George Pickens is not coming back. So, I mean, or not getting an extension, I should say. So, yeah. I, I don't know. And there's also, I mean, you can sign T. Higgins and play out the last year of Georgia's deal and then say, hey, we'll, we'll see what it is at the end. You know, mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah, that's that's perfectly. I, I think that you awesome. might wonder, or at least I would wonder, certainly based off the, you know, pattern of behavior here, along with just the fact, like, this is anybody in this situation, wonder how he responds to that. Like, does, does then a trade request come? Or something yeah, like that, possible. but you deal with, you deal with that when it happens, I guess. Yeah. Um, Tomlin did have a quote regarding George today, though, as well. Which you know, obviously, he's not going to come out and say much. Those things are going to be kept internal. They're going to be kept in house, and that was pretty much the extent of the quote, right? Yeah, he said, "I'm not going to feed the beast. Uh, doesn't do feed me any good." Uh, I guess that makes me the beast, which I will <laughs> take the compliment. I guess. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. You don't have yeah. to feed me. I, I eat well on my own. <laughs> Especially, you know, right after Thanksgiving, I'm sure. coming Been off eating. That was, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks to my birthday back to back. I could probably, I could probably, mm -hmm. the beast could fast. Uh, let's just say that. Uh, hey, while we're on wide receiver talk, just a little note here doesn't necessarily affect the Steelers, at least as of right now, but the Denver Broncos waving wide receiver Josh Reynolds. Alan, this was somebody that I had brought up, uh, you know, going back to free agency. I thought he was a perfect fit, ended up signing to Denver on a two year deal worth nine million, only like four and a half million dollars or something like that was guaranteed on the deal. But he was coming over from Detroit. I thought was a perfect fit. Uh, I think a lot of people may be a little bit lower on because of his performance in the NFC championship game. He got hurt this year. I believe it was his hand, but then he also got shot, uh, and he hasn't been active since week five because of that. But certainly an interesting name to bring up because if he were healthy and ready to return to football, I mean, I don't I, I think I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say if you were getting like last year's version of Josh Reynolds, he could immediately be dropped in here and be the second best receiving option in the receiving room. Now, in terms of what he is right now, I don't know what type of football shape he's in. I don't know how quickly he's going to be able to return from this. Not sure. But just thought it was interesting to bring up uh, that a name that we had talked about free agent and free agency uh, is now being waived. Former teammate of Ben Skoranek and Van Jefferson. Are you trying to rebuild mm. the 2020 Los yeah. Angeles Rams? Um, well, well, hey, I mean, Cooper Cup, well, it was talked about, right? I mean, almost at the trade deadline. If, if the Rams would have really bottomed out, who knows? I guess Skoranek, Skoranek might not have been on the team yet before Reynolds left. Um, now that I think about mm. that. Um, nevertheless, uh, yeah, I mean, I think he's an interesting guy. I think you're starting to get a little crowded. Like, are you going to cut Scotty Miller for him? I could see that, I guess. Um, but like, is he going to dress over what they've been using Skronik for, which has been awesome or Van Jefferson or Mike Williams? I don't know. I mean, I don't really hate the idea of just grabbing him just to grab him, even if there is no plan just because, like, yeah. hey, he's better than not having him. But, like, I I don't really think he would be a player that would be, like, jumping in and being super useful right away. I think I I would also grab him because I'd rather have him on the roster than Scotty Miller. Now, obviously, right now, Scotty Miller's been a game day inactive anyway. I already told you, in my opinion, Ben Skoranek, as good as he can get for a wide receiver five and what he brings to special teams and a blocker, that's a must for me on the game day roster. So, yeah, I don't necessarily know how the hel the helmet math is going to work in right now, at least, but certainly somebody that just because of what he did last year and I think was would be a perfect fit in terms of the type of offense they run and what he brings to the table, uh, I would want to get a look at within the system because I think that there's a chance that Arthur Smith and Zach Dazani get a look at him and they're like, yeah, we, we want this down the stretch. Yeah, I think so. And, um, you know, I think he's just a good fit for their offense. He's a, a bigger body guy, a willing blocker. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I think that's a good fit. Also had a question about Mike Williams and Mike Tomlin talked about Mike Williams. Mm. Um, so I think we can. Uh, Tomlin was asked about Mike Williams and said, 
Uh, let me see if I can find the quote here. Uh, it's going to happen. It's simply a matter of time. I was really encouraged by the playmaking that he made during the week in preparation for the game. And oftentimes when you're making plays in preparation, it ultimately shows up in play. And so I don't think any of us are pushing the panic button in that regard. Uh, I, I think you're, you know, I, I don't know. People are like freaking out about the fact that like Mike Williams has one catch at this point. Um, I, to me, it's not been a big deal. I, I don't, they have not needed him to be a huge part of the offense. Um, He's playing a little bit more week by week. And, um, you know, I think there will be a time when they need him. The you know, the, the amount of cover, too, that I've seen over the last couple of weeks is not exactly what you want to deploy Mike Williams against. I will say that. Yeah. Uh, you know, at least he's not playing zero snaps like a receiver that the Baltimore Ravens acquired at the trade deadline. Um, but I will say when it comes to Mike Williams, I think the other thing that people need to keep in mind, and I think has been prevalent a couple times is the way, th and I'm not saying that this is just like, oh, you know, Mike Williams is like this type of threat where a bunch of attention needs to be paid to him. But I think there's been a couple times where like, you know, Calvin Austin's getting a different look and he ends up making a play because of Mike Williams being on the field next to him. Like I've noticed that a couple of times. Like I think that there's things Mike Williams has done for them that, aren't going to be reflective in Mike Williams box store, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think he opens up stuff on the inside. I pointed out the Calvin Austin play against Cleveland. Um, and I think he's a good blocker. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, I, <clears throat> I didn't think that Mike Williams was coming in here to catch five balls for a hundred yards a game. Like that's not, that, that was never the plan. Um, so, and, and I think they're like, look at, um, look at Cam Sutton. And that's another thing that, that Tomlin touched on uh, this week mm -hmm. as well. Cam Sutton comes back from his suspension in, what, week eight, um, week nine? And mm -hmm. he was playing very minimally. <clears throat> First couple games, you know, he was the dime DB, uh, you know, mixed in a little bit here and there on special teams. And then he plays almost the entire game against the Bengals. And so, like, I think there's one of those coming for Mike Williams here. Okay. Yeah. You look at the splits uh, from that Cincinnati game, Cam Sutton, 45 snaps, which is 72.6% of the defensive snaps. And then Beanie Bishop, just six, 9.7% of the snaps. Alan, uh, is that, do you think a trend going forward type thing? Do you think that was specifically because of the matchup and how do you feel about that being the case? Because I'll be honest, just a quick thought that I have here. I think Cam Sutton's a useful player that you can move around. You can still rely on what he is, you know, above the neck, the way that he sees the game and can wear multiple hats. But, like, physically watching him run, I'm not saying it's a one-to-one -one comparison, but I kind of feel like he just took the number 20 jersey off the player from last year and it brought their athleticism along with it. I think that the thing about Cam Sutton is I, his his coverage instincts have always been really good. Um, I think uh, in terms of, like, if you're talking about a star receiver that moves into the slot, I have a lot of more faith with him covering a guy like Jamar Chase than Beanie Bishop. Um especially when there's a size component to it. Um, and so, like, I think they – going like this week against the Browns, mm -hmm. I think if they're going to move Judy to the inside, like you remember that crucial third down, Judy's on the inside of the slot running across the field, and Joey Porter Jr. is in the slot following him around. I think mm -hmm. I'd rather leave Porter on the outside and play Cam Sutton in there. Like, I think that's a better fit for the team. Um and he can do some things that Beanie can't. I think Beanie's a better tackler. And so I think you know, if you're talking about a team that wants to play like rundown nickel, uh, you know, I think Beanie's a good fit for that. But I think it's just a matchup thing. I think you'll probably see both of them going forward. Okay. Yeah. So like those drastic of splits basically is what I was asking. Probably just the Cincinnati thing, uh, not something. Yeah, to... there will be other teams that are similar to Cincinnati. Um, although maybe Kansas City. Uh, although Kansas City probably going to be a lot of heavy nickel i would assume mm -hmm. uh, to sean elliott kelsey I, I don't know we'll see how that goes i was i was just say they've been playing like like noah grace played quite a bit for them they've been playing both tight ends quite a bit this year yeah, that's why i think heavy uh, nickel would be yeah and they don't really have a running back who is like an elite pass catching threat so yeah they could play that um mentioned uh sutton and you mentioned joey porter jr 
going into the inside or not going into the inside. Someone asked about Joey Porter Jr. Noah Burrow said, what do we think about the idea of having Joey play less press, maybe letting him play off the ball a little bit more? Could that reduce the penalties that he's taken? It would, but I don't think in a good way. <laughs> like the press is what makes Joey Porter good. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. Yep. This is like, like this is like if I bought a Ferrari and uh, <laughs> I was getting a bunch of speeding tickets, and your suggestion was like, "What if you just drove it slow?" <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, uh, I could. On the other hand, maybe I'll just get a radar detector. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like I just, you know, hear me out. I, I, I think. I think playing Joey Porter off man or or you know cover three, he can do it, but mm -hmm. I think that takes away all of what makes him good. He's a 6'2, 225-pound corner with long arms and extremely uh, an extremely strong upper body. He disrupts people with his jam significantly. That is his thing. His yep. jam is his jam. Don't take it mm -hmm. away. I agree. I'm not comparing him. To how good this player at his is, is his position, but it'd be like the Bills telling Josh Allen to not run ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's his. It, it, it's what makes him the player that he is. Joey's been a very good NFL player. I know people are. You know, there's some people that are concerned because of the penalties racking up and everything like that. I, this is not the solution to me to have him not want to get his hands on guys at the line of scrimmage. I just. I think you're doing a disservice. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think Joey has been fine. I, I don't understand the angst. Um, I mean, there was the, the, the penalty against Yoshi Voss in the end zone was quite dumb. The rest of them were, I thought mm -hmm. the one against Higgins was a bad call. And then I thought actually Even both against two of the three against Higgins were bad calls. Um, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Again, even aside from the penalties, though, how have you felt about Joey Porter Jr. this year? Because I, I think that there's people great. that, you know, okay. Yeah, I, I I like the Dallas game. People said didn't think that he was very good in and like people. I think people are thinking he's regressed a little bit from what they saw at the end of last year. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing that at all. I think he's uh, he's a really good young corner. Um, I got I got nothing for that. I mean, I think he's. I don't know what, what more. I, I think importantly, it's with what Tomlin was saying there. You know, going back to the whole serial killer thing, and I think that Joey himself very confident in his ability. The one thing that I do worry about is like from a mental space with guys, but I don't think that he's somebody that you have that concern. Ah, none, none whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and then last thing here, Hayden Bishop. I feel like it's been a few episodes, Hayden. So got to get you back in here. Uh, he said, do we believe that the Steelers would be 11 and one if Russ doesn't suffer the injury? And if he was their starter all season up to this point, Ooh, Hayden with a spicy question. Um, no, I don't think they would spicy, be spicy, but I, I hate these questions. I hate these hypotheticals to be honest. Like, no, I don't think they would be 11 and one. Um, I don't, they did lose those games. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. But I, I think you have different. I think when you have different players, uh, you know, different stuff happens. There may have been mm -hmm. a, you know, maybe they win against. It's like Justin Fields was bad in their losses. That's the thing. Like, in fact, the Colts game might have been Fields' best game as a starter. Uh, so like, especially in the second half, yeah, yeah. So like, I. It, like that's why I don't, that's why I don't think it would have been any different because I I didn't think that that Fields was the problem in any of those games. So yeah, I, mean, I think I think the Dallas one potentially. Like I mean, you know, they only scored what sixteen points, and I didn't think he was very good. And Dallas wins that game with a touchdown with what like sixteen seconds left or something like that uh, at the end. So potentially, but like to that point. Who knows if Russ, you know, maybe Russ loses one that Justin didn't at the beginning yeah. of the year. And one of those, like, it's just hard to figure those out. And, and I think you can make the argument, though, as well. Like, was the game against Cleveland in the snow maybe one that if it happens at the beginning of the year with Justin, 
Like that, that could have been maybe a, more of a Justin Fields game than a Russ game. Like you could make an argument yeah. that they should have played Justin the whole second half and just said forget passing. Like I'm not saying that that's like <laughs> I'm not that saying that like yeah. that like that would have certainly worked. I'm just saying like that's a thought that you could have that I I don't think I could disprove. Like yeah, you know, like sure. Um, I, I would have actually been very down to just actually like see that happen, just to say that I saw it happen. Just like just that's straight up run the option as mm -hmm. an NFL team in the snow. Yeah. So there's other teams that do it. So I'm not like making it seem, especially at the, the high school and even some collegiate level teams do this and stuff like that. But where I graduated from Central Valley, the game that they played at Akershore for the Whippeo championship, they were playing Avonworth high school. They don't pass. Like they were literally just running every single play. They do not pass. So like their opening drive was like 16 straight runs to open it that they ended with a touchdown. That could have been the Steelers in that Thursday night game. Yeah. You watch some of the service academies at the, uh, yeah, even mm -hmm. at the F FPS level, they uh, they do some similar stuff. So, yeah. But uh, anyways, appreciate the question, Hayden. But I, I'm personally not a fan of the the hindsight stuff like that. Are they 11 and one if Russ starts every game? I don't believe so. I, I think that you can make the case for it. You can make the case that they would have lost other games that they won. You could go in a lot of different directions, but certainly open to hearing what you guys think as well in the comments. Uh, until tomorrow, Alan, tell the people they can find you. At Ace Saunders underscore PGH on X Instagram, TikTok, and Blue Sky. PGH Steelers Now is the site's account, SteelersNow.com. Go there, read the word so I can get paid. Like, subscribe, hit that bell for notifications here on the YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. Steelers Afternoon Drive, Steelers Morning Rush, Sights and Sounds, Locker Room Videos, Post Game. We got a new episode of Steelers Spotlight with Aaron Becker coming up on Saturday. Great guest this week. Great guest. Great. 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 Okay. Don't really put in a putting a high bar on that as well so hopefully it's able to and it will live up to the hype i'm sure um alan you mentioned at the beginning that about things changing on the back end just so everybody's is anything changing for the users at all just in case anything they need to be aware of no no okay just want to make uh, as a man of the people i just felt like i had to ask a question on behalf of the people to make sure yeah no Okay. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Hit us in the comments your thoughts on anything that we talked about today. A question for a future episode. As you see, we like to get to a few of those at the end of every single episode. Leave us a five-star review and subscribe if you're listening somewhere else. Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from, you will find us there. Just search Steelers Afternoon Drive. Do the same thing on TikTok. And then, of course, find me everywhere, Zachary Smith, PGH. For Alan Saunders and myself, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive. Yeah.